Stand by to the floor in five, four, three, two, one. Coming to you live from the rich heartland of Altamont Springs, Florida, it's The Vic Show with Victor Bowers, brought to you by Super Channel WACX-TV. Take it away! Greetings! Hello! Hello. Greetings to you all. Welcome to The Vic Show. (laughs) <laughs> yes, welcome to the Vic Show. And Terry and Diane, how are y'all doing? We're doing good. Good, welcome. good. Excited Sinus is draining properly? Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Will we have music today? Will there be background music? There you go. Ah, there it is. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> hmm. Mm. Oh, Vic Show, Vic Show, Vic Show. Yes. So good to be with you, all of you there, there, there. And um, so glad you've joined us again on this few moments together with you. And uh, to see what the Lord's going to say. I, I believe the Lord has a word for uh, the Vic Show today. And... Um, only because the, the, what I wanted to talk about never got took traction in my study for the show. I actually do study for the show. I prepare, and the Lord, you know, I'll, I just want to have something to offer, something to say. And um, and so as I was studying, uh, just over the past few days and last night and this morning up up until about ten after eight, I could not get traction and. Uh, and then I just kind of, just kind of settled in, and put on my belt, on my pants, and um, and uh, just I was like, God, what do you want to say? And He took me back to some other things I had been studying in preparation. So that's what I wanted to mention, just offhand, um, so I don't seem to be discombobulated. To uh, if uh, you know, th- there is something going on, and it's good, and I want to share it to you and share it with you and it's probably a word for you for maybe one person maybe for several people i know it's a word for me and um so yeah so that's just that's just what it's going to be today on the vic show a fresh word but before we get started i will take us um actually it's interesting that um Right before the show started, I was kind of just reorganizing all the knickknacks on my table, you know, my um, my chattering teeth, oh, which by the way, this is vintage from 1980. These chattering teeth, these, these are vintage. They're about, I guess, 40 some odd years old and they still work. Isn't that great? Aren't y'all so excited? The little parts are rusty in there, but they still work. Okay, and anyway, so I was just kind of organizing the table and, and the tiny hands and all that and the miniature cowbell, all the, all the essentials, and I took a book off and moved Fiddle Frog to this side because um, sometimes he gets overshadowed. Maybe he needs, to lo- he needs more light on his face, so I'm going to pull his, hair, his uh, hat back. Yeah, just in case you want to see him. But, and, but I happen to come across a stray... Um, promise out of a little promise box when when I grew up mom and dad had um they had a little it was like a little called a promise box and it was a little like a ceramic figurine shaped in like a loaf of bread like a little loaf of bread you know and in it were these were these little slivers of cardboard paper basically with scriptures on them and we would draw a promise every morning or every Sunday, you know, during the week. And it would just be a unique way to interact with scripture. And it's still unique. I still recommend it. Get a scripture box or a promise box. I think we actually sell them or offer them. We don't sell. We offer for a love gift uh, uh, through the station. You can get them here. Call Thelma. At, uh, hey, Rick, do we have the uh, phone number we can bring up handy? If not, I won't. I'll just, I'll just tell it to you. It's 407 407- 
seven there i'm glad you put it up 407-735-5555 and speak to thelma uh, or maybe someone else but probably thelma she may answer the phone um and request the promise box tell them victor sent you but anyway the promise on this is so appropriate and it confirms what I think the word's going to be today. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him. Nigh is an Old Testament word. Close by. He's near. Um, Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There you go. More scripture pointing to God's presence and God's closeness to us, whether we know it or not. And... um, how that even though Jesus tells us that we that God wants to be in our mind and I'll get to that in a moment God tells us first that we are on his mind and all this comes and and derives from the question I've been asking of where is God where is God and um, in times that we're going through They're not unique to human history. There have always been wars. There have always been rumors of wars. There's always been famines. There's always been pestilence. There's always been um, government upheaval and and nonsense. There's always been that. That was going on in the days of Jesus. That was going on 2,000 years ago. That was going on prior to Jesus. And it went on after Jesus. But in the middle of all that, at a particular place in time, Jesus was born in the middle of chaos, in the middle of of upheaval, in the middle of nations fighting against nations, in the middle of religious strife, in the middle of discrimination and hatred by tribes and groups of people. In the middle of all that, a baby was born. Where? Where was that happening? That happened in Bethlehem. That's a real place. Still there today. And a person grew up and they named him Jesus and he lived a life and he was a boy and he went through puberty and he lived a life and he went to Torah school and and he went to, uh, he went, he did everything boys do, you know, he worked with his father and, and um, he had good days, he had bad days, maybe he even had acne. He was a teenage boy, probably had a few pimples because most teenage boys get them. Even if you are the seed of God, if you're human which he is and was, he got pimples probably. I did. You did. I would say Jesus did too when he was a teenager. And then he grew up and the world didn't change. There were still wars. There were still deception, backbiting, all that stuff. But in the middle of it, God was there. In the middle of it, God was there in in human form. God was working his plan. No one knew about it. Mary knew more than anybody else, but it was still a mystery to her. But God was there. Did Jesus fully know it at every moment of his day, of his life? Well, when he was three days old, I don't think he knew it. When Jesus was a three-day-old baby, I don't think he knew it. I think he grew into the knowledge, and then it fully came at a point in time in his life. But like us, he grew in wisdom. He grew in stature. He grew in intellect. He grew in knowledge. He grew, in, he grew in all the ways we grow because he is human. Okay, so God was there in the middle of it. Jesus crucified, Jesus buried, Jesus resurrected, Jesus ascended. And the world still rumbles on. Wars, rumors of wars. The world didn't look much different after the ascension. In fact, no one really even knew about it except a few people. By the time Paul writes about it in the book of Corinthians, only 500 people knew about it. That's because Paul mentions that number, 500 people. So my point is, where is God? God is here, just like God was there. And today we still have the same problems, yet that doesn't change God. He is here. Where is God? The answer is, he is here. But more than just being here, is do we know it as God in our mind? Most of the time, not. And that's something Jesus addressed when 
And Linda, let's put up that Matthew scripture I just gave you. In Matthew and, and, and I think a couple of the other gospels, maybe all four of them, I, I didn't do my research on this this morning. But the point is, Jesus is asked by the Pharisees and the religious teachers. They're trying to, you know, get him to say the wrong thing. So they ask him a question, which is the greatest law? Because they're going to see if he defies Moses and comes up with his own law. Because Moses told us the greatest law in Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, every Jew knows it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The great prayer, the Shema. Hear, O Israel. That's the great, that's where the law begins for ancient Judaism. So they ask him, what's the greatest law? And so Jesus quotes it. He quotes the Shema with one twist. The Shema, the ancient Jewish prayer says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Jesus takes that and twists it, makes it bigger. He, Jesus replies, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The other gospel, I think Luke or Mark then goes on to read, and with all your strength. The point is, Jesus took the great prayer and expanded it, not at the expense of what Moses wrote, but adding to it, filling it out greater. The law of Moses was about our behavior and morality and all those things and how we worship and how we act and how we, how we live holy. And those, those served a purpose for a time. They were a type and shadow of the fulfillment. Jesus is now saying, all oh, that's good. I'm dragging all of what Moses brought forward. The law, the Torah, all of it, the prophets, the writings, the Psalms, all the wisdom literature. I'm bringing all of that forward. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Where is God? God is here. But is he in your mind? Do you think about him? Well, Victor, what kind of question is that? I think, how can I think of, I mean, what do I even do with that? Well, God thinks of you. God thinks of you. You're on God's mind. And many of us don't know that. We think we have to be the first one to step. No. Once you take that first step towards God, it's because only that's a reaction of what God has already done towards you. Even when you were totally unaware, living in sin. We are saved out of our sin. We're not saved after we come out of sin. We are saved in the middle of our sin. We are saved in the middle of our lostness. We are saved in the middle of our debauchery. We are saved in the middle of the chaos. Jesus was born in the middle of a broken world. He didn't wait for the world to fix itself before he showed up. He showed up at the worst possible time. Israel as a nation was a failure. A thousand years prior under David, they were the glorious kingdom. Solomon blew it out. The world was bowing at Israel and Solomon because of the glory and the power that Israel reflected. The queen of Sheba came and visited and said, I can't even begin to tell you half the story of what I saw. It's too overwhelming. The half has not yet been told. And then things begin to happen and Israel fell and continued to fail, and continued to fail. And then they went into exile. The unthinkable happened. Nebuchadnezzar came in and wiped the city clean, blew over the temple, dragged them all, all, the, all the Israelites to slave, to, into slavery in Babylon. What had happened? Did they think God had abandoned them? They thought that. They thought God was no longer thinking of them. But he was. But now a new thing was happening. The prophets begin to speak. A new thing was coming, greater, but it wasn't going to be like anything they had seen. So in the middle of that, 500 years passes, Jesus is born and he starts preaching. And he's bringing to us not the scriptures of God, not all the Torah, all that stuff. It's good, but now he's bringing to us God. And he's coming and he's washing our feet and he's coming and touching the sick. He's coming and taking the Sabbath day, the holiest day, and he's using it to do the work of the kingdom. Cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead. Those are works, works of God. 
You don't work on the Sabbath unless you're working the works of God. Raising the dead is a work of the God. <laughs> There's no better day than the Sabbath to raise the dead. Okay, where is God? God is here, but he's probably not on your mind. And that's what Jesus came to fix. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. Okay? Well, how do you do that, Victor? Well, it's something you can't do on your own. You receive the grace to do it. You First, you receive the love of God. And for a moment, he tells you that you're on his mind. Linda, let's go on to Psalm 139. I want to read a passage of scripture. It's long, it's 18 verses, but we'll kind of just plod through it because it's all powerful, written by King David. And David was a man who knew the ups and downs of life. He was a full human figure. We can all relate to him in some fashion. He had highs, he had lows, he had great hopes, he had great defeats. He had a family, they were a messy bunch. It was a mess. David was a mess. He was a big hot mess. And God loved him. And David loved God. And David wouldn't stop loving God. That was one of the things, David's heart was fully impassioned towards God. He couldn't help it. And I think one of the reasons he couldn't help it was because he came from a broken past and he had seen what God had done in his life. Okay. He writes uh, Psalm 139. You have searched me, O Lord. You, many of you have heard these passages, but just receive them. Just rest for the f next few moments and receive what the Lord has. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and you know when I rise. You know when I get up. I mean, this is like God looking in on every moment of your day. You know when I sit down. You know when I get up. He's in, your, he's in your house. He's in your bedroom. You perceive my thoughts. He's already seeing what you're thinking. You perceive my thoughts from afar. And this, mind you, this is not an angry, wrathful, vengeance, vengeful God. This is the God of love. This is the God who created the world out of delight. Again, why, why do we eat pancakes? We eat pancakes because they taste good. We eat them out of delight. God created you out of sheer joy, just because he wanted to, okay? God created you not for, not for any other purpose than just to be an object of his love, just to pour love on you. That's the reason you, you're created, to be his object of love. And we fight against it. We fight against it, okay? Don't fight against it. Just, if nothing else, just stop running. Just stop for five minutes. Stop. For the next five minutes, just stop. Okay, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, that's it. This is getting intimate. You, Lord, excuse me. Are you sure this is only water? It's water. Okay, <laughs> sorry. You, Lord, know it completely. The right. Even the bad words, God knows them completely. When they're on your tongue, he knows. And he's still there. <laughs> That's not an excuse, but I'm just saying. Nothing, God, he sticks closer than a brother. You hem me in, in front of me and behind me. And you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful t for me, too lofty. These are, again, very flowery words. David is saying, this knowledge is blowing my mind. I can't even begin to, we can't even, there's not, there, for a lot of us, there's not even a paradigm in our thoughts of a person who knows us this intimately and not out to abuse us or get us. This is a person who's intimately aware of you for your benefit, not to, God doesn't want anything from you. There's nothing you can give God except you. He could take it. He could grasp it and turn you into a robot. He could do that, but he chooses not to because he wants a relationship and he's willing to risk rejection for the risk of having a relationship. This is a God that's, that's, that's 
beyond words. That's what David's saying. The knowledge is too one. You are too wonderful for me, too lofty. I can't even begin to think in that realm is what David's saying. Okay, next, uh, verses five, seven. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? The answer is nowhere. This is rhetorical. Where can I go? This is poetic license. Where can I run? He's being flowery. He's trying to be expressive. You can't run away from God. God, where can I, where can I go? Where can I, the answer is you can't, you can't run. You're hemmed in, you're trapped for your own benefit. So just, just, just stay still for a second. If I go up to heavens, you are there right on. If I make my bed in the depths, the other translations say, if I make my dead in Sheol, if I make my bed in death, if I make my death if I go to hell, if I go to Hades, if I go to the nether regions, if I go to the wherever, if I go to the fiery furnace, you will be there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That story tells us that Jesus showed up in the furnace. You're there. God's everywhere. He's high, he's low. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I fly into outer space, if I settle on the far side of the sea, in the ancient, in ancient literature, the sea represented the beginning of the unknown. They didn't know what was on the other side of the ocean. They didn't have the ability to find out. They took him, at, when this was written, it took about 2,000 more years before someone would be, would be able to travel across the ocean and find other lands. So in the ancient literature, in the ancient mind, the ocean represented the beginning of the unknown. The, an ocean led to great fear. Bodies of water that you could not see the other side to were scary. So when they say, um, let's go back, Linda. Um, if I go, da, 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 da. if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, that's like saying, if I settle in a place I can't even visualize, what does he say? Next. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Even if you go to a place that you can't even visualize. God's hand is already there. <laughs> okay. Where is God? God's here. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me. If you start lying to yourself, and you know how we do. You know how we do. We start lying to ourselves about things we want to do. We start deceiving our own selves. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm guilty as charged. We start lying to ourselves. We start coming up with our own schemes to live a life just to relieve the pain, just to do something. We, we don't know where to run. So we start lying to ourselves. You know, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and that. So that's where I'll go. This is the answer. This is the answer. This is what the prodigal son thought. I'm going to get my dad's money. I'm going to be a free man. I'm going to go out and live the life and ooh, pleasure and all this stuff. You know, money and it would be wonderful. That's the life for me. It's the same thing. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. There were many nights I met Jesus in a bar. Can I get an amen from anybody? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> there were many nights I met Jesus in a bar. Amen. I'm telling you, drunk and high. And I had powerful, I don't recommend it. I do not recommend it. But God, in your most broken place, when you're most vulnerable, which is for some people when you're drunk or high, because that's when the pain is numbed and the Holy Spirit will be there. He ain't too proud. God, God's not choosy. Thankfully, God has no limits. He'll go wherever the trash is at. He'll go to the, if it takes going to the, the city dump to find you, he's, he's on a journey. There, he will, I'm just saying, yeah, right I'm just saying. We, this, is, this is David telling this to us people. God ain't too proud. God, as I said, God has no standards. God lets everybody in. That's what grace is. I know we don't like to preach it because we're like, well, we got to have a little bit of work or you got to preach sin and morality. Yes, you do. But, sin and, but morality is not the goal. Morality is a byproduct of being an image bearer of God. That's God's goal. It's for us to be proper image bearers. When we are bearing the image of God properly as he ordained in Genesis 1 and 2, the sin and the, the morale, all that comes into check. 
the, being a sinless person is not the goal. Being a proper image bearer is the goal. And in that, everything else will fall into place. Okay? Surely the darkness will hide. Okay, four minutes. The night will shine like the day. The darkness is as light to you. God will, fi God will find you. He'll sh shine light on you. Okay? Sure, okay. Next. For you created my... This is... This is the clincher. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I want to stop here for a moment. I believe, and there's a lot of research and study, and when you study the scriptures, there is this point, that David was a bastard child, King David. There's no mention of his mother. When he mentions his conception in Psalm 51, he talks as if he were conceived illegitimately as if he was an accident. Do some scriptures, Google it. Just start doing your own research. See what you find. See what you find. I think David was illegitimate. He was unexpected. He was the last son. He was never on the inside. He was excluded from the feast. When Samuel the prophet visited, they left him out. They, they, they dismissed him. Samuel had to demand that all the sons of Jesse come in. So they dragged, Je Je they dragged David in under, under protest, basically. They didn't want to present David to Samuel because he, he didn't look like the rest of the boys. He had a ruddy complexion. The other boys had an olive skin. He, had a, he was a redhead. He had a ruddy complexion. He was small. He was stout. Or he was built. He wasn't like the other brothers. He was clearly not of the same mother of, as all of Jesse's prior sons. Do some, it's amazing. And then we pass forward to Mary. Was Jesus a bastard child? In the eyes of his day, he was. They all knew the story of Mary and Joseph and that there was a, there was a, missing, part, a missing part. My point is, David knows the pain of rejection. Perhaps he was an illegitimate child, and perhaps he knew it, and he, perhaps he carried that woundedness all the days of his life, and maybe it was part of the reason he was the way he was. So he knew the pain of brokenness. He knew the pain of not being wanted. He knew, the, he knew all that as a writer. And God loved him so much. And he loved God so much. <laughs> You're on God's mind. I just want you to know that. I know it's, our, it's, it's a huge topic. But God would not let me move away. I wanted to get into Passover and Easter and all that. That's a lot of information. And God said, just take a break. Just let people know, I, w he, I want to be on their mind, but even if they don't want to do that, they're on my mind. You're on God's mind. Like it or not, <laughs> where is God? God is here. And you're on his mind. I promise you. You are. No matter what you're doing, no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, all the atheists are on God's mind. Sorry to ruin your day. It's true. There's nothing else to say. Either you believe it or you don't. Hopefully you believe it. Because it's true. And with God, all things are possible. Bye.